This is Olkiluoto on the west coast of Finland, where the world's most modern nuclear power plant is scheduled to go up. But that's no easy task. And the first major mishap already happened at the start of construction. One of the construction crews continued pouring concrete despite a sustained cold snap. This made the concrete liquid mix extremely thick, requiring added water so that it would continue to flow. And this is a safety risk. Concrete for nuclear power plants is subject to special requirements and must demonstrate an extremely high level of material strength. Too much water in the mixture can lead to dangerous cracks that compromise stability. Peter Itiipana inspects every concrete wall at the construction site for the new power plant. He cannot allow any irregularities. Tipana orders construction to stop in Olkiluoto. Almost everything at the construction site shuts down for two months. The concrete samples taken from the reactor's foundation are precisely scrutinized. Are there cracks in the concrete of the six meter thick foundation? If the incorrect mixture fails to pass the inspection, large sections of the multi-ton foundation will have to be removed. In the nuclear area, you don't improvise. You always follow the rules and, and, and procedures and, and don't deviate from, from approved plans and, and specifications. The test results show that in this case, the incorrect mixture fortunately does not diminish the stability of the concrete. The foundation doesn't have to be renewed. Construction work can resume, also in the heart of the reactor island. This is where 128 tons of uranium are destined to be ignited in a controlled chain reaction. German engineer Gabriel Malki is convinced that nuclear energy can be controlled, despite its risks. He's determined to create the most comprehensive, elaborate safety concept ever seen for a nuclear reactor. At the moment, the heart of the nuclear power plant is still only comprised of steel and concrete. But when the nuclear fission begins here, it will create 290 degrees Celsius water-based steam in the reactor island. This steam drives the huge turbines. This is how the reactor is designed to generate 1600 megawatts of power, the highest level of any nuclear power plant in the world. The world's most high-tech nuclear power plant and its safety system represent a prototype. How safe must a nuclear power plant be built in order to justify its operation? The plant's operators are eager to conduct spectacular tests to put any fears or doubts to rest. The reactor will be wrapped in a double shell of steel and concrete to protect it from terrorist attacks. The massive steel bars are part of an unusual protective covering for the reactor wall. Here the wall is 1.8 meters thick. Calculations indicate that this is even enough to withstand a direct attack by a fully fueled passenger plane. This scenario is tested in a laboratory bunker near Helsinki. The Atomic Supervisory Authority wants to be absolutely sure and check the model calculations. But there are thousands of other types of disruptions that could occur, as Fukushima showed us. We will never be able to fully calculate and rule out all of the risks associated with nuclear power. But work here will continue, because the electricity from this nuclear power plant is needed. Rapeseed fields are a colourful addition to our landscape, and an important supplier of raw material for biodiesel. But what's the connection between radioactivity and rapeseed? When in spring the fields radiate their golden hue across the countryside, it's not because the farmers like the colour of the flowers, but the colour of the money they bring in, and that's okay. Scientists have an idea that could help farmers earn even more money from their oilseed rape crop. They want to evolve the plant to protect itself against predators and disease, as well as increasing its yield. The scientists can do this by changing targeted genes in the plant, making a mutation, the GM rape. Mutations often occur in the presence of radioactivity. 
This GM variant is not in favor in many countries because nobody knows what effect it might have on the ecosystem. But it's wrong to demonize mutations as such. They happen in nature all the time. Often they can be caused by radioactivity present in nature and are partly responsible for some of the vast range of variation of species on Earth. So neither radioactivity nor mutations are intrinsically bad, they just contain risks. Perhaps, though, we should allow Mother Nature to mess about with our harvest. After all, she's gathered enough experience over the last few million years. The world's oil supplies are limited. Still, we continue using large quantities of this ever more scarce raw material every day. We need alternatives, and we need them fast. One example is biodiesel. Many petrol stations now offer this renewable alternative to drivers. But how is biodiesel actually produced? The most important raw material for biodiesel in Germany is rapeseed. After the harvest, the black seeds are pressed in an oil mill. This produces approximately one tonne of oil from 2.5 tonnes of harvested rapeseed. The oil then goes to a biodiesel refinery for processing. But the raw oil has to be cleaned of all impurities before it can be processed. The actual chemical reaction that transforms the oil into biodiesel then takes place automatically in large tanks. We have replicated the reaction on a smaller scale in the laboratory so we can observe it. Biodiesel production essentially requires three elements. One is a plant-based oil, in this case rapeseed oil. The second is methanol, a type of alcohol. And the third is a catalyst to set off the whole reaction. The oil and methanol have to react with one another at 60 degrees Celsius for two hours. The scientific name for this process is transesterification. In chemical terms, rapeseed oil is made up of a glycerin molecule bound to three fatty acid chains. During the reaction, the added methanol changes places with the glycerin in the oil molecule. The result is glycerin and biodiesel. Due to transesterification, after the reaction, biodiesel is no longer as viscous as plant-based oil and has roughly the same flashpoint as mineral-based diesel fuel. Before this biodiesel can be used as fuel, one final processing step removes the remaining residue of the methanol and the catalyst. Then it's ready. Now the finished biodiesel can be delivered to petrol stations and many diesel vehicles can use it as fuel without any problems. But why does plant-based oil have to be processed? Wouldn't it be possible to just pour oil from the supermarket into your car's fuel tank? Yes and no. In principle, plant-based oil could be used as a fuel, but the expense and the effort required for retrofitting engines to use it would far outstrip that for biodiesel. For engines to be able to handle the oil, they would have to have a preheating phase that heats the engine to operational temperature. Aside from this, they would need an additional tank, because they would still need normal diesel to start. But plant-based oil has advantages in terms of the amount of energy it requires. The production process for biodiesel is more complicated than for plant-based oil. Around 30% of the energy gained by producing biodiesel is lost again in its production process. For plant-based oil, this figure is only 15%. The question as to whether rapeseed biodiesel or plant-based oil is the better fuel cannot be answered conclusively. Both fuels have advocates and opponents. A metal powder and a solvent form the basis of the explosive called TBX. But just how explosive is this powerful mixture? And what's the connection between rapeseed and an explosive powder? The history of gunpowder is not exactly clear-cut. No one can be certain when it exploded onto the world stage, but it's likely that it was the Chinese who discovered it roughly a thousand years ago. The enthusiasm for colorful fireworks in Asia has remained uninterrupted ever since, and the majority of rockets that light up the sky every New Year's Eve come from China. 
so that these silver streaks end up in something more, rapeseed is added to the gunpowder, causing the colorful fire to hang in the sky. It's these seeds that are responsible for all the oohs and ahs. But there's a problem. In China, oilseed rape is a genetically engineered strain. Uh, so what, you say? They still glow. Uh, true, but experts have discovered that after the rockets explode, there is still about 1% of the seeds unburned and fertile, and they fall to earth. In many countries, GM crops are strictly controlled and limited to specific areas. To have Chinese GM seeds spread around the countryside each new year isn't helping. These rockets might cause us to say, Ah! Professor Alfred Kaplan. Explosions are his passion. He experiments with gunpowder and fireworks. But Professor Kappel is not a daredevil. He's a chemist who works on the explosives of the future with the aim of making them safer and more effective. Professor Kappel is busy conducting an audacious experiment in the bunker of an Austrian explosives factory. The plan sounds like quite a stretch. Two substances that are harmless on their own, a metal powder and a solvent, should become an explosive four times more powerful than TNT when they are combined. I want to develop an explosive that offers enormous power combined with maximum safety. The formula is his secret. He will only reveal this. The chemical behavior of the metal powder can be altered by the solvent. It triggers a number of reactions that can make the metal powder explode. In order to arm the mixture called TBX, Professor Kappel still needs a strong primary detonation. Theoretically, there's still no danger. On the other hand, we don't have a lot of experience yet with this compound. So, in the interest of safety, the components are combined via remote control. The great unknown here is whether the substance can actually detonate or not. A chemist who decides to work with explosives certainly doesn't do so out of a sense of adventure. I personally don't know of any risk takers who did this kind of work for years and years. Explosives technicians who can look back on a long career can still look down at ten fingers. The powerful substance is combustible, but it doesn't react to shocks or vibrations. This is a huge advantage over other explosives and means that transport and storage are possible without any danger. But just how explosive is it? For the first detonation experiment, Professor Kappel has a steel pipe filled with the TBX so that when the detonation occurs, the mass will be penetrated by a strong shock wave. The greatest danger is this. Without doubt, the greatest danger is overconfidence. That's the worst. No one can take the attitude that they know it all, that they can do it all, and that everything's going to be easy. The risk is just too great with explosives. You have to stop and keep your ambition in check. You have to take a breath and think about what the next step is. Now the critical phase of Operation TBX can finally begin. An additional load of powerful plastic explosive is intended to detonate the TBX mass. The theory is that the primary detonation, the booster, will fundamentally change the chemical behavior. Professor Kappel is hopeful that the turbulence created by the first smaller explosion will trigger an explosion in the new inert explosive mixture and multiply its effect. But it's only theory up to now. The result is difficult to calculate, and it's potentially too dangerous to risk this first explosion outdoors. This is why this experiment is being conducted in a rock tunnel. Everything happens here in the weak light of an explosion-proof lamp. The smallest spark can create huge danger here in the explosion chamber. Professor Kappel hopes that TBX explodes slowly and effectively. 
To test whether this is the case, sensors are placed at regular intervals in the pipe. They will register how quickly the shock wave expands. The detonation is conducted remotely. Will the new explosive fulfill the expectations? Down inside the tunnel, the test will now only be observed by a single camera. The TBX detonates with a heavy blast that the team can also clearly feel here. And the measurement reveals that the detonation speed is significantly slower than that of TNT. When you experience an explosive for the first time and you immediately notice that all your effort wasn't wasted, that you've created a product that not only fulfills your expectations, but it actually exceeds them, that is a genuinely great feeling. TBX detonates slowly compared to gelignite, but its pressure phase lasts 100 times longer. Catastrophes might be one area where this new, safe and highly effective explosive could be applied. The powerful pressure waves generated by TBX might be used to simply blow out forest fires or burning oil rigs. Algal bloom is the name used to describe the massive reproduction of algae in bodies of water. These phenomena also serve as guardians of our climate by trapping CO2. But where exactly is the link between gunpowder and algae? Algae are just as much a part of a healthy ocean as fish, shrimps and shellfish. But when there's too much algae, something is wrong and it stinks. The reason behind it is too many nutrients in the water. It's become over-fertilized. It's obviously not the case that somebody is going around feeding the ocean plants, but artificial fertilizers used by farmers for their crops are finding their way down the rivers to the sea. Fertilizer is both a blessing and a curse. It all began with Frederick the Great of Prussia. He proclaimed that whosoever can cause two stalks to grow where previously there had only been one shall be greater than the greatest general. A title won by an artificial fertilizer called saltpeter, and there were tons of it in Chile. Flotillas were dispatched to South America to bring this white wonder back to Europe. Saltpeter has another trick up its sleeve, though. More than only a fertilizer, it can be used to make gunpowder. In 1914, as the world began its descent into war, ever more convoys of ships sailed to Chile to return with ever more saltpeter. It too landed on the fields, but now in the form of shells and grenades. And the algae? They knew not a thing about it. Paul Ashtern is a research ship headed for the untamed Antarctic. 51 scientists from India and Germany are participating in an adventurous experiment in the search for answers to questions of global importance. With tons of research equipment on board, they are tracking tiny life forms in the icy southern ocean. For many on board, this is a journey into an unknown microcosm. But expedition leader Viktor Schmetacek is right at home here. We live on a wet planet. Our planet is wet. Even we are just big bags of water, if you like. But because we're land animals, we don't have the same access to life forms that live in the water as we do to land-based animals. So we live within the framework of land-based life forms. But everything is different in the water. It's a completely different world. And all life in our oceans is dependent on phytoplankton, single-celled algae. They absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in order to grow. But there are parts of the world's oceans where plankton are relatively rare. For instance, the ocean current around the Antarctic is home to surprisingly few algae, despite the fact that there's an abundance of nutrients for them here. The theory is that these microscopic plants are simply missing a single trace element in order to be able to live here, iron. The researchers want to know more. Their 70-day expedition begins in Cape Town. They are out to prove that 10% more of the world's CO2 
could be trapped and recycled as oxygen if this oceanic desert was supplied with iron. It's well known that a natural supply of iron results in algal blooms. The Antarctic's melting glaciers are one source for water-containing iron. Another source of phytoplankton nutrition is desert dust. The Sahara is an almost inexhaustible source of minerals. Storms whip up the desert dust, including the iron it contains, and spread it far out into the Atlantic Ocean. Experiments in fertilizing algae with iron have already been conducted, but none went on long enough to determine how an ecological system treated in this way would be affected in the long run. Viktor Schmetacek's research team wants to find out if algae fertilization can indeed sustainably improve the climate. In the end, there are two likely outcomes. If the algae die after the bloom and sink to the ocean floor, then the CO2 will be rendered harmless for centuries, if not longer. This would be ideal. On the other hand, if the algae are eaten by animals in the upper levels of the water, then the trapped carbon dioxide would be re-released back into the atmosphere shortly after the algae are digested. Then iron fertilization would be utterly useless for the climate. Back to the high seas. The researchers lower large collection devices into the icy waters. They should show what plankton organisms live here. Early experiments observed a predominance of diatom blooms. Diatoms are phytoplankton with a hard shell made of silicic acid. Their growth is also directly dependent on the concentration of silicic acid in the water. The researchers want to know how high this concentration is. The initial data is a complete surprise. Apparently, diatom bloom has already occurred here in the past. This means that something heavily fertilized the water and the algae continued reproducing until all of the silicic acid in the water was used up. I didn't anticipate such a heavy influence here from melting icebergs. I think this is unique. The conclusion is that the iron in the water melting off icebergs has an enormous influence on the plankton organisms. Now that the diatom's heyday is over, it's the turn of other plankton. What we found here instead is Phaeocystis algae. These colonies are capable of forming extensive blooms, so we're hopeful that these Phaeocystis algae will pounce on the fertilizer and form a broad bloom. Another candidate that may prove to be interesting is Emiliana Huxleyi, EHUX. It would of course be highly interesting to conduct iron fertilization and induce a bloom from EHUX. Uncharted scientific territory, but perhaps also another important contribution to climate protection. There are new environmentally friendly innovations in the textiles industry. New fabric manufacturing processes make it possible to produce biodegradable t-shirts. But what links algae to textiles? People wear clothes, almost always, and it's usually a good thing. The continuous contact between us and textiles places high requirements on the clothes we wear. Underwear in particular needs to be not only comfortable but also gentle to the skin. Cotton and silk are the favourite materials. Aha! cried the scientists. Now there's another star in the firmament of foundation and it's made out of algae thread. We're accustomed to the thought of algae being a healthy sort of plant, and it's a thought that's confirmed by a trip to any Japanese restaurant. This healthy association is now set to enter our consciousness for Aperol and induce us to wear algae undies. Well, why not? We started off wearing fig leaves, didn't we? They produce useful substances instead of rubbish. Ants return everything they take from nature in a different form. Michel Braungart has taken this as inspiration and is now an advocate for a new line of thinking in environmental protection. Formerly, Michel fought for Greenpeace. Today, he's busy in his own institute coming up with ideas for products that should never become rubbish in the first place. One result of his research is biodegradable fabrics that return to the natural cycle once they are used up. This principle is called cradle to cradle. One Swiss textile enterprise is already manufacturing according to this principle. The concept refrains from using today's popular black fabrics, 
because black dye cannot be produced without pollutant chemicals. And this decision is paying off. This is leftover yarn and fabric. They can go straight into the compost heap because they're harmless, non-toxic. This could also be the future of these biodegradable t-shirts once they're worn out. A clothing manufacturer in Berlading in Germany has been producing goods for years on the basis of the principle of the eternal cycle. For the concept to work, everything has to happen under one roof. This way, the entire production process can be monitored. Particularly important procedures like dyeing, bleaching and printing. Michael Braungart looks after every detail here. All in all, around 40 process steps are different. For example, we use a different fabric manufacturing technique. But this also means that everything from the yarn to the labels to all of the dyes we use have to be practically reinvented and adapted. This new thinking even goes so far that new processes are being developed for cleaning the fabrics. Holger Zinker is a biotechnologist who provides ideas. Virtually all of the cosmetic, detergent and textile products that we buy and use nowadays are increasingly biologically friendly. And the processing of these materials is also increasingly biologically friendly. This actually represents a sustained trend. The object of his detergent research is simple dirt. He's looking at the ground itself for the cornerstones of a new cleaning principle, and he's finding them. Holger has found an enzyme that breaks down dirt, then returns to the ground from whence it came, so to speak. This revolutionary, environmentally friendly cleaning procedure won Holger Sinker the German Environmental Award. The vision is that there will be companies who produce their entire product range on a biologically friendly basis. Environmental expert Michel Braungart is driven by the same vision. He even envisions the principle of the cradle-to-cradle -cradle cycle in terms of cars. And his recycling principle also works with technology. After five years, this car will be immersed in a bath. Enzymes will devour the adhesives that hold it together. Then the materials used to build it can be separated and reused again, just like in a Lego car. He's already applied this recycling concept to his own desk chair. This is where he sits to come up with new ideas that follow the example of the ants. Don't burden nature, work with it.